new poll released by Abacus Data shows a majority of Canadians feel Pierre Polyev is best suited to solve the climate crisis and solve the economic problems. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. However, before we discuss that, we're going to be discussing some of the electricity issues that are starting to plague Canadian culture and Canada as a whole. I was listening to the uh, Sustainable Committee, and they had a lady from the McDonnell Laurier Institute, and this is some of her opening statement, which is really quite eye-opening. The task we have set for ourselves of an emissions-free grid by 2035 is made all the more difficult by the fact that electricity demand is rising for the first time in decades. This is due to a combination of a growing population, electrification of energy use, and new areas of demand such as data centers. Despite this rising demand, investment in the electricity center in Canada is anemic. Based on Natural Resources Canada's most recent major projects inventory, the number of projects planned or under construction in the electricity sector declined from 223 projects worth $156 billion in 2014 to 182 projects worth $98.9 billion in 2023, or equivalent to $78.9 billion in 2014 dollars. It's a 49% drop in value. So since the Liberals have taken government, investment in electric electro, electricity generation has dropped by 49%. That is ridiculous when you consider the amount that they push the green cars that they put, or excuse me, the electric cars, and that they push all of these battery plants. And they do all of this talk about the electricity that needs to be put up inside of Canada without ever understanding the magnitude of the drain on electricity. It's almost like they, they're just a bunch of kids you know, talking in art class or something that just are, you know, they're just having debate over coffee. They don't really seem to truly understand the impact that all of this uh, adjustment is having on the country as a whole and in the people as a whole. And all the while they're, you know, funneling all of these dollars to their friends in the slush funds while the projects that Canadians need to, to have the expansion that they keep talking about, to have the green economy, to have the green culture that they keep talking about, we don't, we can't generate because our investment into electrical manufacturing, like electricity, excuse me, manufacturing is half what it was when the liberals took office. Then the expert started to talk about how this might impact Canada, this lack of investment into the electricity that the liberal government has been screaming at us for years must be the transition to, right? We got to stop with the fossil and start to use electronics. seems to me that the liberal government doesn't understand what, how do you generate electricity? Adding even more barriers and costs to the cream electricity regulations and other policies will absolutely hamper Canada's ability to expand its generation capacity and compete for data centers and energy intensive manufacturing. This is bad economically as well as strategically. So because our electricity is so bad, we can't, inter- uh, we can't entice investment in industry, which requires an, ex- an enormous amount of electricity. Don't forget you know, every factory you see has forklifts in it. And that's just, don't just think about the lights. Think about the amount of electricity required to run the equipment, the amount of electricity to run the uh, support. Like like I said, the, the um, forklifts or the heat, all of the things that go into this building, we, because we're not generating the electricity that those industries will require, we're not going to be able to introduce them. And if for some reason we need them strategically, we won't have them either because of the regulations that the liberal government is putting on it. So now they're saying, you know, go green, go green, go green, but they're making it impossible for everybody to start to generate more electricity. You have to wonder what they were thinking when they initiated these ideas or were they just reacting and not thinking at all? You can let me know down in the comments. Now, if all of that wasn't bad enough, the expert goes on to talk about some of the ideas that the Liberal Party are putting forward as to replace the, um, the like how they're going to put the electricity back into the grid. And it's pretty eye-opening the way that she terms or the way that she explains it. I also want to address the risks to the way we are planning to add clean electricity to the Canadian grid. Many environmental advocates, as well as some Crown corporations, are pushing for the majority of new electricity generation in Canada to come from solar and especially wind power. There are several risks to this. The first and most obvious is that they are intermittent sources, and across most of Canada, the sun does not shine and the wind does not blow during winter load peaks. But I want to highlight the energy security costs and benefits of differing electricity sources. 
Canada has abundant natural gas, uranium, and water. Our supply chains are almost wholly domestic for nuclear, hydro, and natural gas power generation. By contrast, the global supply chains for solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, and electric vehicles depend to a large extent on China, a potential adversary on whom we've been applying tariffs due to unfair trade practices. So the, the liberal idea is to go with solar and wind, which they've been talking about since the 70s. And we know that they put a whole bunch of wind in Holland many, many years ago. Those, those turbines have been there for a long time. What they, what they leave out of telling you is that when the turbine is not turning, when the wind is not turning the turbine, they use a diesel generator to fire it up. They get started with a, um, a diesel, it's just diesel. I mean, what is the sense in calling it green or calling it wind or telling yourself that you have to stop using fossil fuels if you're using fossil fuels to begin the wind. Now, the word she used was intermittent, which is to say, especially in you might know in Canada, when the sun, when the, the cloud will come in for three days, so solar is not going to work. On top of that, when an insurance company comes by, it turns out that when they come by your house and they see that you've installed an, um, solar panels, they won't cover the house. They won't cover the insurance on it because they don't, they're saying that the electricity load could be too much for the, what the house was designed for. I don't necessarily know the ins and outs of the insurance game, but I do know that I read an article about it not that long ago and how people are being encouraged to put solar panels in. And yet this, once they do, the insurance company will come along and say that we're no longer going to cover your house and you have to start looking for a new insurance person, like a carrier, as they call. As for wind, they're trying to tell you that they can now use wind to generate um, hydrogen off the East Coast. That's the plan out there. They're going to use wind to generate the electricity that's going to separate the hydrogen from the water and i don't want to get into it too too elaborately though i did do a video on it when they made the announcement in the summer what the expert says is that uranium we have to make nuclear reactors we have a lot of natural gas that we can then use to to create electricity and we have hydro which of course is the number one source for electricity now the problem with the hydro is that you definitely you need it to fall down so we put up a dam and it creates, you know, gravity does it. We don't like to do that necessarily too much anymore. So the idea of looking at natural gas and looking at um, nuclear is something that appeals to people, to the people that are in, inside of that. And there's a company that's creating uh, nuclear reactors that can sit on the back of a truck. They're excellent for generating electricity in the remote. And I'll do more of a video on that, not in this one. In this one, I just wanted to show you that the liberal government is gaslighting everybody in Canada by telling us that on the one hand, they want everybody to do this. We're investing in batteries in Canada. We're investing in batteries. We're, you're taking billions of dollars and putting it in the tax. And don't worry about the fact that all of my friends took the green slush fund and ran away with it. So now I was, um, Abacus Data did a poll and they were talking about the... Uh, they were talking about to Canadians about some of the current issues, and it turns out that the Canadian population has done a massive swing away from worrying about what the environment is causing. From September, here's the poll here, right? So September 19th to 25th, Abbas data conducted a national survey of 1,700 Canadian adults there to examine their perspectives on climate change and their priorities in context to pressing pressing immediate challenges such as cost of living and housing affordability. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I will say, look, shifting priorities amid immediate challenges. 62% of Canadians are concerned about climate change as a potential impact on the future, while only 13 indicate that they are entirely unconcerned. And then it breaks down which, who believes in what, like depending on political party. Now, if we move forward to the actual numbers, we can see that very concerned is only 23%, concerned is 19%, and moderately concerned. So they didn't put in and not concerned at all. They just simply, oh, it's at the, it's at the very bottom. I see how they did it. So it, it's a scale of one to five, you know, five being not concerned at all and one being very concerned. And they calculated the percentage, 49% of which were actually this, the um, Conservative Party. However, down in the not concerned at all, almost 22% of the respondents were identified as being conservatives. And 11% are green, which is strange because the green only has a couple of seats. So I'm really surprised that they have that kind of, uh, uh, you know, that there's enough of them to make that kind of, a, to make a dent on the, um, on the statistics. So here's the real blow to the Liberal Party's message, right? This question is, considering the challenges facing Canadians today, where do you fall on the spectrum regarding your priorities for addressing climate change? I prioritize immediate concerns 
about cost of living and housing over climate change. 39% of the people said that they would, they're worried, they're not worried about it at all. The only people that put it as number one, 3%, I prioritize climate change over all other things. And I prioritize climate change over Im immediate concerns around housing and cost of living were 2%. So 5% of the people that were, were polled, the 1,700 people that were polled, I were worried about climate change above everything else. All the other, 90% decided that they weren't going to worry about it. It can't be 90%. It's got to be, what, 40, 71, 95%. Yep. 95% decided that they weren't going to worry about climate change in any way, shape, or form. In any way, shape, or form. I mean, they were worried about more about housing than they are about anything else. And that makes sense. Come on. Of course it makes sense. It's hard to worry about what's going on when you're, when you're living in such fears and concerns. Of course, if you tell that to the Liberal Party, they'll just call you some sort of an ist and try to paint, use their media propaganda machine to paint you as some sort of a villain. There was one more aspect of this poll before we talk about the bombshell that came out about Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives that I wanted to show you, to share with you. One in two Canadians believe the Canadian government should seek a balance between economic growth and climate action. So they're not willing to go to the extremes. They should find a soft way to do it, not an extreme way to do it. Like, okay, everybody start paying us all your money so that instead of you, you won't have it to spend on gas or heat for your house or food for your belly. That's, that's kind of extreme. They want to balance. They want to find something in the middle. Like maybe the climate tax that we put on industry is okay and the climate tax, carbon tax that we put on people is not. Maybe we should invest in filters like they do in, in Europe when they burn their garbage to create electricity. I mean, there's, there's got to be a middle ground, but you can't talk to a fanatic, right? You can't talk to an ideologue who is just a fanatic. They don't, they don't want to listen to you. They refuse to talk to you. They, anytime you try to say something to them, especially with these far left liberals that we got going on here, you, they just start calling you names. And they, again, they use their, you know, the control of the media to propagandize their issue and somehow try to paint you as a villain for disagreeing, for daring to disagree with them in any way, shape or form. <laughs> I can't, I can't help it. The last question that I covered from this poll, which leader is best equipped to address climate change and the growth of Canada's clean economy? I'll say that again, climate change and the growth of Canada's clean economy. Right, so you got Trudeau standing up in the House of Commons every other day, going, "Oh, and we're putting people money in everybody's pocket," which we know is is a lie, and we're doing it in a way that addresses climate change and is growing a green economy. Well, it turns out that Canadians don't agree with him. That Canadians are not willing to support him in his ability to to do to solve both of these problems. Only 17% of people asked. Meanwhile, 30% of people asked, said Pierre Polyev is best equipped to solve climate change, which you, all you hear from the far left is that he doesn't even have a plan, and yet 30% of the respondents believe that he's the one. More accurately, 17% believe that uh, Justin Trudeau can do it. So not even 20%, right, of the people. He's only a little bit above... Jagmeet Singh, more people were unsure than they were being sure of Justin Trudeau. You can see there the 26% indicated unsure and 17% picked Justin Trudeau, 13%. I mean, only 9% picked the Green Party at all. The block is so far out of it, you might as well not even mention it. And far and away with taking Jagmeet Singh and the NDP party and you add it to Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party, they still have to tie with the conservative party led by Pierre Polyev so per being perceived as the only person to solve both of these problems in a way that are not going to make you feel homeless, that are in a way that's not going to cost you all kinds of billions of dollars that is being corruption being slipped out the door. I mean, can you imagine how they take this news? Just, just, just appreciate the egos that they have, the narcissism that that is is shows in in all of anyone talk to them. I mean, Christina Gould can't stop staring at herself when she talks. 
Imagine what this number is doing to her right now. She must be losing her mind. Stephen Gilbo is probably crying in the corner. Maybe this is why we haven't heard from Sean Frazier. Maybe he got a hold of this report and decided that he couldn't show his face. I'm not sure. I can't speak for what the, what the liberals aren't doing. I can only say that the 30% of the respondents said that they feel that Pierre Polyev is both capable of getting them out of the environmental issues with the green economy. <laughs> Unbelievable, right? Because all you hear is, oh, he doesn't have a plan. He doesn't have a plan. Apparently, people believe that he can come up with one. Apparently, people believe that he has the ability to solve the problem. That's probably based remarkably and enormously on the fact that Justin Trudeau keeps talking and talking and talking, and none of these problems are going away. They only seem to be getting worse. They only seem to be growing, not shrinking. All right, I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time.